So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we have Imam Isa Wood here. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. He's one of my very close friends and always very insightful. MashaAllah. And uh, one of the people I've seen grow spiritually. Uh, very much so. So inshallah today uh, Imam Isa is going to introduce us to a very interesting subject. The conclusion is going to be about, I guess, something that relates to why the Dajjal wants Makkah. But before we get there, uh, we have to uh, cover a few other uh, points or a few other subjects. So Imam Isa, I'm going to just hand it over to you, inshallah, bi'idhnillah, and uh, take us on this journey, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone, and uh, jazakallah khair, Sheikh Omar, for having me on your show. Um, so, uh, without further ado, bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma rabbi shurah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqbadha min lisani wa qawl qawli. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan urzuqan al-tiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila urzuqan al-jtinaba Allahumma arina al-ashiyaa kamahi Allahumma rabbana zidina ilma Those of you who don't speak Arabic, I was just saying uh, may Allah make it easy for me to give this presentation in a nutshell and then may Allah let us see truth is truth and follow it and falsehood is falsehood and keep us away from it let us see things as they really are and increase us in knowledge So before you continue, uh, Issa, this is probably a good place to stop because I can always cut this off or we need to work on your sound just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. I mean, we can keep it the way it is, but if we, if, if there is a way to fine tune the sound. Uh, what needs to change? Uh, okay, so I hear like an echo, like I guess a echoing in the back when your pitch goes too high or, or that does not make sense. I know you're an expert when it comes to sound. Hmm. Um, like when you just said, hmm, so it like vibrated longer. Dang, that's the thing I was worried about. I don't have my headphones with me. Hmm. I mean, we could still do the recording without worrying about that. No, 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 because that's the worst ever is when you record one and the sound is no good. Like it's like unlistenable sometimes. No, this um, is very listenable. I'm just right. trying to talk about tweaking it. <laughs> I'm trying to think um, maybe if you got farther from your mic i have an external microphone let me let me go grab it and plug it in see if it changes anything. Okay, so I um, designed this uh, little talk we're going to do today uh, about four years ago, um, and I've, I've learned a lot since then, but it's a, a very, very insightful journey on just taking one single ayah of the Quran, trying to understand it on a really deep level, connect it to other ayah in the Quran, and then look at the various subjects the ayat is talking about in a deeper level to help steer us as to where the world is heading, okay? So I have to begin by thanking all the people who have um, contributed to this information. Uh, first and foremost would be um, Sheikh Imran Hussein. Hafidahullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. Um, he's inspired so many people around the world to think about what they're reading. Um, Dr. Ali Atai, uh, who contributed to part of what I'm going to talk about today. And then there's an endless number of YouTubers who've made some very fascinating videos that I'll try to um, play during today's talk. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see what I see. Okay, can you see the ayah on the, on the screen? Yes, alhamdulillah, yes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَلَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِّنْهُمْ لَيَكْتُمُونَ الْحَقِّ 
Wahum Yalamu, which roughly translates as the people of the book know this as they know their own sons, but some of them conceal the truth which they themselves know. And I believe this is in um, Surah Al Bakhara. So we're just going to concern ourselves in this ayah with this little pronoun here at the end of the word, Ya'rifun. Okay. So it's an interesting pronoun, who. Um, when you look up a kind of a general tafsir for it, you find that it's basically referring to the fact that the learned members of the children of Israel, they know the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, like they know their own sons, but they keep trying to hide that from everyone. Um, but if you read more tafsir, you find that this who is referring to lots of things. And so we're going to explore for the next uh, few minutes some of the things that I believe this is referring to um, so that we can expose on a really amazing way that how this ayah is true on so many different levels and miraculous on so many different levels. But we cannot do that until we understand a very important subject, which is that we're talking about the people of the book. If we want to understand what they know and understand, we need to know the language of the book that they read. Now, for those of you who know the Arabic language in today's lecture, you are at an advantage today. For those of you who don't, you are at a disadvantage. So in order for me to give this presentation to you in a way that you can have yakin certainty about what I'm saying, you need to try to learn the Hebrew alphabet. So everyone knows some of these symbols. Uh, this is the Aleph at the top in Arabic, and this is called Aleph in Hebrew as well. Um, you have letters like ba in Arabic, but you also have the bet in uh, Hebrew. Uh, you have the letter jim here on the third row. Okay. But I have a question for you, Sheikh Omar, since you studied in Egypt. How do you say jim if you're an Egyptian? Ga. Yeah. Exactly. So in Hebrew, it's called gemel. Now, why might... Beni Israel pronounced their J that way. Any guesses? Does it have to do with location? Yes. Somewhere they were located at one point in their history. In Egypt. Right. They were slaves in Egypt for a very, very long time, which happens to be, to this day, the place where J becomes G. So... Interestingly, in the Yemeni Hebrew pronunciation, they call it, you know, they call it Jeddah, right? So everybody is clear. They call it Jeddah Gadda. Right. You know? So, uh, so they changed the gene into a Ga. Right. Instead of saying Yamul Jumu'ah, they say Yamul Gumu'ah. Yeah, that's a better example. Yeah. So, uh, so they were, they uh, were locked up as uh, basically pr prisoners in uh, Egypt for 400 years. And in the Yemeni dialect of Hebrew, uh, this is pronounced Jemel, which is camel, right? As we know in Arabic. Um, I'm not gonna go through the entire alphabet, but I just wanna point out some important letters that are gonna become uh, uh, important later on. So Dal is Dalet. Now, don't forget this letter. Dalet with a little top here and a little leg there. Okay. And then if we go all the way to the bottom, we have this letter Ha. And I always, uh, when I was teaching little children Arabic, I would tell them, now go run around the masjid a few times. When you're finished, you'll say, ha, 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 ha. right? You're panting like a dog, right? This is Ha. It's uh, different than, than the Ha that comes from your stomach. Now, in Hebrew today, right, the equivalent of ha on the bottom row is a letter called chet, okay? This is a mispronunciation of that letter. It comes from the fact that the Ashkenazi Jew is the majority of Jews today. And their pronunciation, since they are European Jews, and we all know where they really come from, they mispronounce this letter as a ch, when in reality it's a ha. 
The reason we know that for certain is that there's already a ch sound in Hebrew. So there's not two chas in, in, in Hebrew. But when you listen to uh, the average uh, Zionist Israeli talking today in Hebrew, you'll hear lots of <laughs> over and over and over. So this is a very important letter for today's talk. So on the screen today, the ones that you want to remember are the Aleph, the Ba, the Jim, the Ha. Uh, these are the ones that are going to become important later. And then finally, look at some of the other letters that are on here. The only one I'd like to point out to you on this page uh, is Lem on the fourth row down from the top. It's just called Lemed in Hebrew. And then the Mim, which is called Mim in Hebrew as well. These are important. Now, what was the ayah that we read? Ya'rifunahu, they know something. Ya'rifunahu kama ya'rifuna abnahum, just like they know their own sons. So just a simple word for you to learn in Hebrew right here is El, which is the ancient name of God in the Semitic language, right? So we have Jibril in Arabic, right? And as we and you discussed one day, uh, Jibril comes from Jebar or Jabbar, right? The name of God meaning power. So, so this name combined with Il is the power of God. So Gabriel is the power of God, okay? So you have the Aleph and you have the Lamb. Now, I don't know how much time, uh, Sheikh Omar, you've spent watching uh, evangelical Christian pastors talk about Islam. It's always negative. And one of the things they try to do is they try to otherize Islam, right? And you'll find uh, Zionist rabbis will do the same thing, which is to try to imply that Muslims do not worship the same God that Jews and Christians do, okay? So we're going to dispel that uh, right off the bat. Firstly, by using the Hebrew language. Um, here we have the letters Aleph, Lamed, and He. Not the Ha, but the He that comes from your stomach. And we have the name of God written in Hebrew in three different Semitic languages, uh, Arabic, Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic would have been the language that Jesus, peace be upon him, would have spoken. And the only differences we find between any of these written in Hebrew are the vowel markings. Okay? So just like we have fetha in Arabic, they have petha in Hebrew, right? Indicating a, a certain vowel sound. So the vowels are different. And this makes perfect sense because you know, uh, you've spent a lot of your time in the North, Sheikh Omar, I'm down here in the South, and we know that uh, we pronounce things slightly differently in the South than we do in the North, uh, and even in the English language in America. So a person wants to get in a car and go down the road to Walmart, or they want to get in a car and go down the road to Walmart. A car and a car are the same automobile, but that's how we pronounce them differently. Well, Beni Israel are in the North, and the Arabs are in the far South, so it makes sense that they would slightly have a different pronunciation, but the consonantal root is the same in Allah, Elah, and Elo. Okay, all of them are referring to God. But I think we can do better than that. Have you ever seen a Gideon Bible before, Sheikh Omar? You ever stayed in a hotel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course you have. And have you ever seen an Arabic Bible? Yes. Okay, so if you ever grab a, an Arabic Bible, and there's lots of Arab Christians all over the United States and throughout the world, you can get them to show you this. And you open to the very, very first page of that, you'll find uh, the opening paragraph of the book of Genesis written in Arabic, where it says, In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So right off the bat, we see the name Allah mentioned, I don't know, six or seven times in the first paragraph. And this is from an Arabic Bible. But when we go to the Gideon Bible distributed, I mean, these people boast that they've given out over two billion Bibles all across the world. And like they show 40 different languages on the first page that they've translated the Bible into. They give you examples of it. And this is the example they give you in Arabic. And of course, they take their favorite verse from the uh, entire New Testament, which is 
لِأَنَّهُ أَحَكَذَ اللَّهُ أَحَبَّ الْعَالَمُ So, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. And of course, what do we have here underlined in red on the screen, blatantly obvious in front of us, is that they, the Gideon Bible Society, have chosen to translate the word God as Allah. So, of course, we know this to be the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ankabut, that not to argue with the people of the scripture, but speak to them in a very good way, except those who commit injustices among them and say to them, we believe in that which is revealed to us and you. And our God and your God are the same God. But what does the ISA? say? Some of them want to hide that fact from people. Right, by otherizing Islam and making it seem like we don't worship the same God, when in reality, Ya'rifuna, who they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kama Ya'rifuna abna, just like they know their own children. Very interesting here is we have the, you could say, the Shahada for Jews, which is Shema Yisrael Adunai Eloheinu Adunai Ichad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. God, the Lord is one. The Lord is God. The Lord is one. Right. So we have so Ahad this is, instead of Ahad. So, so this is like, uh, you know, something that Jews are supposed to say in the morning and in the evening. And if a Jew is on their deathbed, they should repeat this. Right. And this is exactly the same for the Shahada in Arabic for Muslims. Um, this is what makes you a Jew. Um, the first word in it is a command, Shema, which is listen here. Right. And then the statement is, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, here. And then, of course, the subject uh, is Israel. The sentence that's important is that the Lord is God. The Lord is one. Like that's the statement. Everything else is just telling you who to listen to what. Now, let's look at something we should all know as Muslims, which is the first ayah of Surah Al-Ikhlas in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'da'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim so in this we have you know the most fundamentally important concept in islam which is tawhid the idea that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and without partner so are you familiar sheikh omar with the asbab and nuzul for this ayah yeah i mean there are two versions right there's one in the makki version and there's the madni version Right. So the first opinion is that the Mushrikeen of Mecca are inquiring uh, of the Prophet Islam to describe to them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second opinion is that it's the Jews who are asking about it. So Allah does something very amazing here in Arabic. Now, if we look at the ayah itself, the first thing we see is the command, qul, say, and then the sentence that's important, which is who Allahu Ahad. Now the subject of the sentence, right? The mubtada is huwa, which is the uh, personal pronoun for God, right? It also can mean he uh, when referring to uh, nouns that are either masculine by gender or they're masculine uh, as they're assigned that way. And they don't have a gender, but they're just given a masculine assignment, which is the Arabs uh, already had that worked out long before the Prophet Islam came along. So Hua is used in place of God as a pronoun here, but some Muslim scholars, as you know, Sheikh Omar, have also mentioned that this is a name of God, Who? okay? So it's the subject, and then it says Hu Allah. So he is Allah, or he is God, one, Ahad, right? And one in a very unique way, not Wahid, but Ahad. Now, some Muslim exegetes and grammarians have said that actually what's happening here is that you have a Mubtadit, a subject, Huwa, and then you have Khabarain, two predicates here. So Huwa Allahu, Huwa Ahad. He is Allah, he is one, is actually what's being said here. Yes. Which, interestingly enough, what do we have here in the Shema? The Lord is God, the Lord is one. 
And mm -hmm. Elo, we already talked about in Hebrew, is the same thing as Allah in Arabic. They would be written exactly the same. And the Ihad here is actually how that should be pronounced, because remember that letter that the Ashkenazi Jews have corrupted by saying is Ha, but really is Ha. Yeah. So Allah uses the exact same word in Arabic, Ahad and Ihad. And what's even more fascinating is this tetragrammaton here, right? Which the Jews are using the word Adonai, which actually is not what that says in Hebrew at all. It's the sacred name of God for Jews. One of the ways to pronounce is Yehuah. So Hua, right there in the name, mm -hmm. just like Allah says here, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. In other words, when Allah revealed this ayah, he took the Shema from the Jews and he put it in Arabic in the most concise and perfect way possible so that they would know that when the prophet is talking about Allah and this Quran, which is already talking about the children of Israel and Musa and all these great things, that the theology that the prophet was bringing was the same theology they had. Ya'rifunahu kama ya'rifuna abna. So that they would know that the Prophet ﷺ was upon the same deen and worshiping the same God that they and their own sons worshiped. So first you describe the word Allah, how it's been hidden. And over here you're describing how the Shahada has been hidden. Right. By, by then. Okay. So yes. now we're going to the second part. Okay. So the first part of this, and you can feel free at some point in the future to kind of cut this video up, is I'm showing you how the concept of God has, has been made vague, okay? And, and the, the words that would show the association between Islamic theology and Jewish theology uh, has been muddled intentionally, right? And that today, right, propaganda is taking place throughout the evangelical, Zionist, Christian, and Jewish world to try to keep people from seeing that, no, we do, in fact, worship the same God and have exactly the same theology. Okay, now we're moving on to the second part, which is the most obvious meaning of the verse, which is that they know the Prophet Muhammad like they know their own children. So we're going to watch a little bit of a video. I'll try to pause it occasionally so you don't get any copyright hits. Okay, yeah. Upon every close scrutiny of the alleged references to Muhammad in the Bible as a prophet, they absolutely have no relation to the prophet of Muhammad, nor prophesy his coming. So here are evangelical Zionist Christians trying to imply that there's no way there's any references to Muhammad in the Bible. Uh, Muhammad is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Muhammad is not mentioned anywhere. Genesis, the revelation. And Muhammad is God's true messenger. That's a joke. Whoever made this video. Lo, we inspire thee as we inspired Noah and the prophets after him, as we inspired Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, and Jesus and Job and Jonah and Aaron and Solomon, and as we imparted unto David the Psalms. So Allah says in the Quran very clearly that he's giving the same message, the same revelation that he gave to all the prophets to the prophet Muhammad says. Notice he mentions Solomon. The verse we've just heard is from chapter 4 of the Quran. 
In the verse, God is affirming to humanity that Muhammad, is indeed the recipient of a divine guidance, just as Noah, Abraham, and the rest of the prophets. However some Christians and Jews today, don't believe that Muhammad was a prophet, and the covenant that God made with Abraham. And since the Quran is not their book of authority, in this video I'm going to show you that the book you're holding in your hands, contains the name off the seal of prophethood, the prophet Muhammad. As known, the Old Testament was preserved in the Hebrew language. In the fifth chapter of the Shir Hashirim, which is one of the five Mejilat or sacred scrolls, that are part of the Hebrew Bible, or for short the Song of Solomon, as Christians know it today. So, so Song of Solomon the, uh, is part of the Tanakh, okay, which is uh, the, you have the Torah, you have the, the Ketuvim and the Nevim, okay? These are the Torah, the first five books, right? You have the Nevi'im, which are the books of the prophets. And then you have the Ketubim, which are the sacred books, mm -hmm. right? So you have like a, the example of the prophets would be like the books of Ezra, right? Or the book of Nehemiah. And then you have the, the sacred writings like uh, the Psalms. And in a lot of Jewish literature, you'll find that all of this, which Christians call the Old Testament or Jews call the Tanakh, is actually called Torah, okay, or instruction, right? It doesn't necessarily, the word Torah, have to refer to just the first five books, but it can refer to all of the sacred like literature contained in the Hebrew Bible. The chapter is discussing someone. Jews will say it is discussing Solomon, while Christians will say it is discussing Jesus. Considering this is the Songs of Solomon, it would seem logical that it is discussing Solomon. So this is one of the books uh, called the Song of Solomon inside of the Hebrew Bible. Hmm, I'm sorry, my video just skipped ahead for some reason. which is one of the five Mejilat or sacred scrolls that are part of the Hebrew Bible or for short the Song of Solomon as Christians know it today that chapter is discussing someone Jews will say it is discussing Solomon while Christians will say it is discussing Jesus considering this is the Songs of Solomon it would seem logical that it is discussing Solomon the verses describing this mystery man have the narrator speech conjugated in the feminine, meaning it is a woman who is describing this man. So it is possible that it is one of Solomon's wives discussing her husband Solomon. However, Christians assert that Jesus is being discussed, and that the chapter is describing a man, who was not yet alive at that point. A prophecy. In reading the English translation of Song of Songs 516, it finishes the description by saying, He is altogether lovely but what most people don't know, is that the name of that man, was given in the original Mejilat. Here is verse 16, and how it is written in ancient Hebrew, before introducing the vowels, in the 8th century. From the Hebrew Bible, on scripturetext.com. Now here is where your little lesson at the beginning of today's talk, Will come in handy so at this point they're taking a passage out of the song of solomon that we're theorizing is referring to the prophet muhammad and they're showing you that in translation it doesn't mention his name but we're going to see if his name appears in the hebrew inshallah bible on scripturetext.com Here is the word in question. This word is made of four letters. Mem. Het. Mem. Dalit. Remember the het. Now when reading the word as it is written in its original form, with no vowels, it can be read as Muhammad which is the name of the Muslim prophet, or as, Mamad with no A after the H. 
According to Ben Yehuda's Hebrew English Dictionary, it is correctly pronounced as Muhammad, not Mamad. We'll prove that soon. So how we're going to know for sure, if it's pronounced as Muhammad, the Muslim prophet, or as Mamad, a random Hebrew word, the only way is to give the verse to a rabbi, and say to him please read. Here is the Song of Songs 516, and how it is read by a rabbi from a Hebrew Jewish site, please notice, the im in Hebrew, is a plural of respect. <laughs> זה דודי וזה רעי בנות ירושלים, חיכו ממתקים וכולו מחמד, 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 מחמד דים, זה דודי וזה רעי בנות ירושלים. So this is the issue in question. Is this referring to the name of the Prophet Salaam Salaam? Okay. Well, how are we going to find out is we're actually going to go look at the passage in question, which is very very fascinating. So when we go to Song of Songs, um, we're going to look firstly at the um, entire entirety of the uh, Song of Songs passage in which this occurred, right? So we don't take it out of context. So it starts off here by describing a person. And I'm reading the, um, the uh, English translation. It says, my beloved, right? Which, which we would say uh, Habibi, right, in Arabic, is radiant and ruddy, or another word would be white and red, I've seen in other translations. Now, for those of you who've studied the Shema'i literature about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi his description, we find that he was neither very dark or nor was he pasty white, but he was somewhere in between. He was ruddy. It says he's the outstanding among 10,000. Right, so who does the Prophet ﷺ march into Mecca with to conquer it uh, at the near the end of his life? Ten thousand of his followers. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy. Right, so we find in the Shema'a literature that the Prophet ﷺ's hair was neither curly nor was it like completely straight. straight right, it was in between. It was wavy. And he, and he is black as a raven. Now, wow. here's a very, wow. very wow. interesting, super interesting word in, in Hebrew. So it says he's black as a raven. Now, when you go to a, a Hebrew site and you take this word raven, okay, the air, uh, Hebrew letters of raven are ein, reish, and bet. Okay, so Arab. Is, the, is actually the word here. In oh, Hebrew. okay, wow. Uh, by the way, the, the, the kuf here at the beginning is uh, kind of like how kaf functions in Arabic. Uh, it means like, right? So, oh, okay. So, so the word for raven in, in, in Hebrew is ein reish bet or ein ra ba, right? But what's so fascinating is that it's also the root for the word Arab in in um, Hebrew as well. And, and actually... Some rabbis have trouble translating certain passages of the Old Testament where a raven is mentioned uh, because it could also mean Arabs. Hmm. So he's black as an Arab is one way that that could be read. Also in anyway, the Shema, it, it talks about how many white hairs the prophet had. And so he had all black hairs. One of the companions of the prophet, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the narration I think I remember is one time a companion counted his white hairs. He had 11 white hairs. And I think there's another narration that mentioned more. The whole hair was black with the exception of very few hairs. So that's why I found that interesting. When um, because the person standing at like two feet or more would see completely black hair. Right. So like anyway. you me, you would see completely black hair maybe, but I have like small white hair strands. Yeah, me too. I got no to tell. Um, hopefully the power won't go out. I hear like some thunderstorms outside. So inshallah, Allah will keep this going. All right. So we don't want to go through the whole thing. We just want to get to the main portion that's important, which is where it comes down and it, it starts to describe. Um, it says that his mouth is sweetness itself. Okay. Now, what's one thing we know about the Prophet is that he used to use the miswak all the time. 
okay? And he would use it constantly, always brushing his teeth with it. In fact, he literally died with the miswak in his mouth. SubhanAllah. And they said that the, always a beautiful smell coming out of his mouth. He is altogether lovely. If I say something is lovely, it's also praiseworthy, right? Mm -hmm. And this is my beloved, this is my friend, daughters of Jerusalem. Now, when we take this passage in Hebrew and we go to a site that gives you the Hebrew words, we get to this word altogether lovely, okay? And what do we find written in Hebrew? Oh, wow. That's Muhammad. Muhammadim. Yes. Right Muhammadim right here. Okay. Now, what I find really fascinating, really interesting, is every single day all over the world, Muslims, we say the tashahud when we pray. And we say, I think in all the narrations of the tashahud I've ever read, Muhammad is uh, jar wa majroor. It's Muhammadin. Right, yes. Allahumma yes. salli yes. Yes. ala Muhammadin. Yes. Yes. Right, not yes. Muhammadun or Muhammadin, yes. but Muhammadin. Yeah. Right. And in this passage in Hebrew, both names and descriptions uh, will typically end with this im at the end of them. Okay. Uh, this is letting you know that this is an adjective or this is a noun. Uh, it can also be used to make something plural, right? So it has different uses in the Hebrew language, right? Uh, so I'll give you a good example in Hebrew. We know that the name of God in Hebrew is Elo, but you'll also find the name of, of God written in the plural form, Elohim. Yes. Okay. And Doc, uh, uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer, uh, one of the most famous YouTube rabbis I've ever seen, uh, he mentions that Oftentimes, Christians will say that the im here implies that God is a plurality of things. Well, he says, no, the reason the word im is used at the end of elo here is because it's a word, a name of God that includes all of his attributes and powers. Now, what is the equivalent of that in Arabic? Allahumma. Allahumma, Allahumma. yeah. So Allahum is the exact cognate of Elohim. So when we say Allahumma, we're asking Allah by all of his names, right? So is this a adjective or is this a noun is our next question. Well, let's think for a moment. In Semitic languages, like many languages, are not names and adjectives the same? Like in English, we have Dr. White, okay? Dr. White. White is a color, but white is also his last name, okay? And we have so many examples in the Arabic language, mm -hmm. right? Neda is her name, but it also means dew that forms on grass in the morning. So it can be read as a name. Well, let's take the name and put it into Google. So I'm going to take the first four letters Mim het mim dalit. I'm going to copy them. I'm going to go to Google Translate, and then I'm going to ask Google Translate to translate it for me. Okay. So, paste. Uh oh. What? What just happened here? It didn't give me Muhammad. In fact, it didn't even give me the word they translated it as lovely. It <laughs> gave me, gave me some random word actually. Well. For many, many, many years, I used to give this presentation, and whenever I would plug in these four letters in Hebrew, it would always say Muhammad. Oh, wow. And since the internet never forgets, let's go back and watch me do that on a recording of this very talk from another <laughs> message. <laughs> because the internet, alhamdulillah, doesn't forget. So let's watch Brother Isa back in 2017 when he was a little bit younger. So we're going to take the passage here out of Hebrew, we're going to copy it, and we're going to paste it into the engine ourselves, okay? So just so you know, I'm going to do it in front of you. So this is the passage, this is the word in question. I'm going to copy, mem het mem dalit. Copy. Then we're going to go to Google, and we're going to see what Google has to say. What do you say, Google? Is this the name of our prophet? No. <laughs> yes, it is. MashaAllah. 
Mim, het, mim, dalit. Mim, het. I guess they didn't like your presentation. Het, not hey, het, mim, dalit. Now, well, many, many Muslims figured this out and they started going to the site all the time. But you know, they have to conceal the truth while they know it to be the truth, right? Isn't that what the ayah we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation said? So the good news is right here on the website, you can clearly see mim het mim dalit. Now what's so fascinating about this is that really the only difference between the Hebrew and the Arabic is that Hebrew does not have the concept of shedda. So it's not Muhammad here, it's Muhammad. So there's no shedda. So it, does, it wouldn't work in Hebrew that way. And then other than that, it's the exact same sounds that we use in Arabic for the prophet. Mim yeah. is mim, het is ha, and dalit is dal, right? <laughs> in fact, it's the same consonantal sounds and everything. And then put in the context of the verses, it's describing a man who sounds a lot like the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace be upon him. So it can be read, he is uh, my beloved, he is my friend or daughter. I'm sorry, uh, it can be read, um, uh, his mouth is most sweet. He is, he is Muhammad. Muhammad. This is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. In other words, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Khalil Allah, just like Abraham is, is the friend of Allah, and he's Habib Allah. Right, he's the beloved of, of Allah of, of God, um, and so he's the beloved and the friend, O daughters of Jerusalem, trying to tell them something. So, Ya'rifuna who they know the Prophet Muhammad, sallam, kama Ya'rifuna abna'ahum, just like they know their own sons, but some of them try to conceal that from the rest of us. Okay, so you can, if you get a chance in the future, you can cut it right here as a second part. Now, the third so part Google, is so Google is Jew. I have no idea who runs Google, but apparently they did not like I mean, they're the hiding the name of the prophet. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, uh, we'll do it right now. You, if you copy the whole thing with the aim at the end, which is yeah. not necessary to the word, uh, it'll still show up properly in Google. Uh, it used to be I had I could do just the four letters. So, see, it still says Muhammadim, oh. right? Mm. But see, um, the, the Hebrew language functions a little bit differently than Arabic. In Arabic, you can leave off the in right uh for a, a noun or a um or an adjective um and, you know like the way people usually speak when they speak to each other in arabic they don't say the the endings uh to the nouns but like i okay. said it's very very fascinating to me how how the allahumma salli ala muhammadin <laughs> is still functioning in the tashahud today okay so you might so, say your video is off just so you know I mean, you can continue with the presentation, but. When you say my video is off, my share screen needs to be fixed. No, no, your shared screen is fine. There we go. All right, I'm back. Yes. Yeah, let okay. me know if any of that pops out. I have kind of a, a bad connection to my. Um, no issue. All right, back to share screen. Okay, so back to our presentation. So we know that the Jews know the Prophet Islam is mentioned in their scripture. Uh, what's even more fascinating here is if we actually go to the Torah, uh, we find something very fascinating. So in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, so this is part of the first five books of the Bible, uh, God is talking to Moses here, peace be upon him. And he's telling Moses about what will come after him. It says, I will raise up for them, the children of Israel, a prophet like you. So he'll be like you, Moses, from amongst their brethren. So in Hebrew, the word ach, which is like achi, my brother in Arabic. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he will tell them everything I command him. Now, take notice of what I've highlighted here in bold, right? So he puts his words, God puts his words in the mouth of the Prophet. What is, what is the, does, does the Prophet speak from his own uh, hawa, or does he only speak what is revealed to him, 
right? As Surat Najm says, he speaks what Allah revealed to him. And he will tell them everything I command him to tell them, okay? So what is the Prophet Islam? He's giving us his, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's amr, his commands. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the Prophet will speak in my name, right? So we have the concept of speaking in the name of God. What does every single solitary chapter of the Quran, except for Surah Tawbah, begin with? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, which we already know and proved at the beginning of this talk is the name of God. So, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. Okay, so they're telling the children of Israel, if anyone comes to you and says they're a prophet, but they don't speak in the name of the God of the children of Israel, right, then you have to kill him. He's a liar. So you may say to yourself, how do we know when a message has been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be alarmed. Hmm. So this is the criteria the children of Israel were supposed to, to use for any prophet who came to them, not just uh, one that came like Moses. He has to speak in the name of the God of the children of Israel, and he has to speak things that will come true. Hmm. If neither of those things come true, then you kill him. So now you understand why the Jews wanted to kill him when he came to them. It was because that would prove to them that he is not a prophet. Mm. That's why they want to kill all the messengers. What? Uh, uh, so Allah says, uh, they killed the, the prophets, right? Because that was like their way of proving to themselves, right? crucifying them, killing them, beheading them, stoning them, crushing them with a boulder, poisoning them, whatever they had to do. Now, we also find the same interesting concept in the New Testament. So this is now Christian literature. So in the book of John, at the very beginning, the Jewish leaders have heard of this person in the wilderness named Yahya, John the Baptist, and he's baptizing people and they send a, a group of priests and Levites to ask him who he was, okay? So this is the, the high priests of the children of Israel during the time of Jesus, and the Levites who are the, the uh, all, uh, descendants of Aaron, Harun, peace be upon him, who have a special status uh, in temple worship in Judaism. So it says that he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. In other words, he told them exactly who he was. He says, I am not the Messiah. So they were waiting for the Messiah at that time, and he told them that he's not the Messiah. So they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? So Elijah, this is one of the prophets mentioned in the Old Testament. He never died. He was, he was raised into the heavens, and it's said in the later days that he will come back and announce the Messiah. He says, I am not. So are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So there are three distinct people being mentioned here. One is the Messiah, one is Elijah, and the other one is the prophet. If you read the tefsir or exegesis of this passage uh, by Christian commentators, they'll say that this last third person is referring to the prophet like Moses mentioned in Deuteronomy 18.18. Well, in the book of John, you find out that, of course, Jesus is the Messiah. He says it very clearly when he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he's talk, who's, who's talking to him about the Messiah. Jesus says, I am the one to whom you refer. Okay. And then Jesus explains that actually John the Baptist is Elijah. He is the one sent to, to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. But there's no mention of this prophet. In the rest of the New Testament, except in one interesting place, which is where John gives a prophet, I mean, uh, Jesus uh, gives a prophecy about something that's going to come after him. So it says, if you love me, Jesus speaking to the Hawariyun, the disciples, he says, keep my commands. So if you love Jesus, then there's apparently some sort of Sharia you're supposed to follow. <laughs> um 
And I will ask the Father, and we all know, those of us who are familiar with, with uh, the language of the children of Israel, that they would refer to God as Father. We find this in the Quran, where they say, Nahnu abna'uhum wa like we are the children of God and his beloved, okay? So we know that they use this kind of language. And he will give another advocate to help you who will be with you forever, meaning until the end of time, until the day of judgment. So I will ask God and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The advocate is called the spirit of truth. Now, what is the Prophet Islam's nickname throughout his entire life from the time he's uh, basically a teenager until he dies? In Mecca, he's called As-Sadiq Al-Amin. Mm. Both of these referring to his truthfulness and trustworthiness. Mm. So it mentions the world cannot accept him, but it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him and he lives with you and will be in you. And so then he goes on to mention at the bottom, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Mm. So God's going to send the spirit of truth, and he will tell them about Jesus and they are required to testify. Now, I'm going to bring you a very fascinating hadith, Muttafaqun alay in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ says, anyone who bears witness that there is no God except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger and Allah has no partner. And then adds to that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, the Spirit of Allah and the word bestowed upon the womb of Mary shall enter paradise. Oh, and the, and the paradise is real and the hell is real. So enter paradise through any gate they wish, even though they have very few good deeds. Mm. So here we have the Prophet Islam making an article of faith. In fact, part of your salvation to testify that Jesus is the messenger of God. And you must also testify something to think about if you're Christian and watching this. So then it goes on to describe the spirit. It says that he, notice how many male personal pronouns are mentioned yeah. here. He, the spirit of truth, uh, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you unto all truth and he will not speak on his own, right? You know this ayah from Surah Al-Najm, right? He will speak only what he hears, what is revealed to him. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will talk about the future. And he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Who does the Prophet ﷺ meet during his Isra wa Mi'raj in, the, in I believe, the third or fourth heaven? He meets Isa alayhi yeah. salam. So all of this is referring to the fact that Jesus is telling them about something to come after them. Someone who's going to come after them. Apparently a male who's going to testify about Jesus. So these are the prophets. Muhammad, and he has very black hair and wavy hair and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Now, what's kind of interesting um, is that there's a relationship between the word advocate mentioned in those verses, uh, which is the word paraclete in, in Greek, and it's related to the word uh, that Jesus uses for the Prophet Islam, which is Ahmed. Um, so there's a relationship there. It's not a clear cut relationship, but it's kind of an interesting thing to look into. So this is part three, uh, mentioning the prophecies in the Old and New Testament about someone to come like Moses, who will testify about Jesus, and it gives his description. So Ya'rifuna who? They know him. Now, here's we get to the conclusion of today's uh, program, which is based on the uh, title that we give it today. Here we have the uh, our, our part four, which is Hajj. Now, we know Hajj in Arabic is Ha and Jim, 
but this is above it is what Hajj would look like if you wrote it in Hebrew. Now, remember, we talked about two interesting letters in the Hebrew language, which is het, which is mispronounced today by Jews as chet. And then we have the word uh, letter gemel, which we said is only pronounced that way because Beni Israel were held captive in Egypt for such a long time. It can be pronounced as gemel, as the Yemeni uh, Hebrew uh, alphabet is pronounced today. So this is how it would be written. It would be written as hajj, but the modern day Jew would pronounce this as chag, chag, okay? okay? Well, is this a meaningless word in Hebrew or does it have a meaning? Well, when you look it up, the word chag in Hebrew actually means four fascinating things. It can mean to go around in circles. Like it can mean, hajj, right? it can okay. mean to uh, have a Almost. feast. It can mean to sacrifice or it can mean a holy day. Mashallah. Now, we all know that uh, during the Hajj pilgrimage, we make tawaf around the Kaaba. We have the days of tashriq, which are, as the Prophet some days of eating and drinking. We have the sacrifice of the Udhiya, right, uh, or Qurbani. And then we have the holy day of Eid al Adha. Okay. Now, before we see if this word is mentioned anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. Let's see if the place of Hajj is mentioned anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. So in Psalm uh, 84, which is uh, what uh, the Quran is likely referring to when it says Zabur, uh, this is a book attributed to David, Dawood, we find in verses 4, 5, and 6 the following statement. Blessed Okay, in other words, they will be blessed are those who dwell in your house. So apparently Allah, God Almighty has a house somewhere and those who dwell in it are blessed. They are ever praising you, right? They're making hamd, okay? Um, when you go visit the Kaaba in Mecca, there is no single person who would go there and not at least pray one time. And of course, the opening of our prayer is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is to Allah, the Lord of everything. And of course, going to the house is a blessing of the forgiveness of sins. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, right? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. They recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can have any transformative power or strength. Who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Hmm. So there's a house somewhere where people are praising God. They pilgrimage to it. They praise him. And as they pass through the valley of Becca, hmm. very interesting. They make it a place of springs. So there's some kind of well there or mm -hmm. spring or waters coming out. And the autumn rains also cover it with pools. So it floods there occasionally. So here we have a very, very clear description of a place called the Valley of Becca. Now, Sheikh Omar, do we find this word Becca anywhere in the Quran? Yes. Uh, exactly. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the first house ever established for mankind is the house in Becca. And we know this is related to the Arabic word to cry, okay? Um, and that mim in, in Mukharij al-Huruf, the, the, the articulation places of letters in Arabic, mim and ba come from the place of, of iklab on your lips, right? So this word Becca, What's fascinating is it refers to a type of thorny plant that only grows in the Hijaz region of Arabia. <laughs> mm. So here we have a very, very clear description of Mecca and the Kaaba from Dawood in the Psalms, but it is concealed from us if we don't understand what we're talking about. Okay. Now, before we get started, we're going to see where Hajj is mentioned in the Bible, and we have to introduce a character. This is Rabbi Avi Lipkin. Rabbi Avi Lipkin is in 
a, a Zionist rabbi, um, and he has written a book called Return to Mecca. And oh, in wow. it, he, he's going to describe to you his theory on the Hajj pilgrimage being mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures. And just when all hope seemed lost, message of a new discovery. Avi Lipkin is here from Israel, and he's brought his brand new book. It's called Return to Mecca. And the title of this book, Return to Mecca, what, what could that possibly mean? And, and on the cover is a picture of a black cube. That's where the story starts. Avi, let's, let's start right One there. One point here. Yes. The, the Kaaba um, is a cube, though. I believe <laughs> that the Bible... Uh, say what, Sheikh Omar? The Kaaba is not a cube. It's a rectangle. But I think they consider, because they also have that cube thing they put on there. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to get there, inshallah. Okay. Is a GPS. Uh, I believe that the Bible uh, took place, a lot of it took place in Arabia. Actually, in most churches, Christians say to me, we know that Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai, is not in the Sinai Peninsula, but rather in northwest Saudi Arabia. It's called Jebel al uh, I am the first Jew in the Jewish world who's coming to the rabbis and saying, the Torah is a GPS. Uh, Jethro, the high priest of Midian, I believe was the high priest of the Kaaba, the black stone, which is today in Mecca. There was no Mecca. It was just a black stone in those days. Our father's Jethro. He's Sheik of Midian. So throughout this, you'll see peppered in uh, a couple of scenes from the movie Exodus, uh, the Charlton Heston film from, I believe, the 70s or 80s, uh, describing uh, Moses. Uh, Moses was the son-in-law of Jethro. Moses was the understudy of Jethro for 40 years. Now, before I allow Avi to go deeper into this, we need to remember the story of Musa. So Moses is one of the children of Israel. He's placed into a boat in the river. It goes down the river Nile until it reaches the palace of Fir'aun, Pharaoh. Um, his wife decides to take the child and adopt him. He's raised in the house of Pharaoh. Uh, when he gets older, he goes outside the house and he sees some of his people and their condition. And one of the Egyptians uh, is actually harassing one of the children of Israel, who then calls on Moses for help. Moses goes and hits the man, and he hits him a little bit too hard in the wrong place, and it kills the Egyptian. Uh, the next day, a man comes running from across town and tells Mo Moses, look, you need to leave Egypt because you're going to be tried and receive the death penalty for what happened. So Moses runs away to a place called Median. And while in Median, he meets two women at a well. He waters their animals for them. They return back to their father. And their father, according to the Tafsir literature, his name is Shu'aib. Okay, this is not necessarily Prophet Shu'aib. This is Shu'aib, but a descendant of Abraham. Okay. And Shu'aib then offers his daughters to Moses, uh, one of his daughters to Moses as a wife and asks Moses to stay with him for eight to 10 years. And then Moses finishes the contract and he goes with his family out into the wilderness, at which point Allah gives him the command to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let the children of Israel go. So this is what Avi Lipkin is going to be uh, discussing. Which is today in Mecca. There was no Mecca. It was just a black stone in those days. <laughs> Father's Jethro. He's Sheik of Midian. Oh, yeah. So anytime you hear the word Jethro, okay, which is a very interesting word related to the word Yethrib in okay. Arabic. But uh, Jethro is the name the Bible uses for Shu'ai, the father of the two women in Median. He's also called the high priest of Median. Okay. Uh, Moses was the son in law of Jethro. Moses was the understudy of Jethro for 40 years. And when Moses went to take the children of Israel out of slavery, he gave them the phylacteries, which they are to put on their forehead and on their left arm, as a sign from God that we are leaving the pyramid system of slavery in Egypt, and we're going to the cube system of freedom in Arabia. And it must be remembered 
that there was no Judaism in those days, there was no Christianity, there was no Islam. All people, including the Israelite slaves, were pagans. And of course, the golden calf, basically the children of Israel reverted to the gods that they had known in Egypt yes. when Moses delayed coming and back. Of course, we know that Ravi, uh, Rabbi Avi Lipkin right off the bat is pretty wrong here. Uh, right, he, right. But he's, he's probably trying to say there was no prophet Muhammad yet, right? But of course, we know Islam is the original deen that goes back to the time of Adam. So the purpose of this book is to show where exactly we were, and that 38 years, at least, of the uh, Exodus was in Arabia. Uh, Moses, Aaron, Jethro were at the Kaaba, which is today Mecca. And when God says in Deuteronomy 11 that the borders of Israel will include the desert to the south, that desert is Arabia. Okay, so in a nutshell, what Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Avi Lipkin is saying is that when Moses was with Jethro or Shuaib and Median, that he learned about the Hajj pilgrimage from Shuai or Jethro. And then when he went back to Egypt, God commanded him to tell the children of Israel to let, uh, or to, to tell Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go, because the plan was to take the children of Israel into Mecca so that they could perform the Hajj pilgrimage. Hmm. And that God gave Moses a sign to give to them, which was this interesting thing we're going to talk about in a few moments called the phylacteries or teflon in Hebrew, which is a ritual that Jew, religious Jews still do to this day. Okay. And Rabbi Avi Lipkin uh, mentions at the end that um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to his, his theory at the end. Okay. So without further ado, Let's take a look at this symbol that Moses was supposed to give them. Firstly, let's talk about this, the phylacteries. So religious Jewish men, and most of us have never met one. In fact, the average Jew today is completely secular, uh, has no uh, religion that we can really point to <laughs> in terms of rituals. Um it's hard to find an Orthodox synagogue in most places, uh, unless you live in like New York or LA. But if you ever go to Palestine, uh, you'll meet these people, they're everywhere. Um, and they do this ritual, I believe three times a day, where they take a black cube and they tie it to their forehead and a black cube to their left arm. And inside of this cube are four passages from the Old Testament. One of them is the passage that refers to the Shema, okay, which is the Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Another passage refers to this ritual where Moses says, you know, bind this to your forehead and to your arm. And then the other passages refer to going into the wilderness to do something. Okay. So when we go to the Hebrew, we find that this word in Hebrew, chag, appears in the book of Exodus right at the very beginning, or mm. hajj. Hmm. And that it is referring to the children of Israel going into the wilderness for a feast or to go around in circles or to make a sacrifice or for a holy day. It could mean any of those four. So the passage in question, and this day shall be unto you a memorial and ye shall keep it as a feast. Okay, here's the word hajj here in Hebrew. You should keep it as a feast to your Lord or a holy day to your Lord or a time to go around in circles for your Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it as a feast and an ordinance forever. It shall never end until a day of judgment. So I direct you all now to a very interesting article you'll find on the Internet written by a gentleman named uh, Shibli uh, Zaman. Um she, Brother Shibli, he wrote this article. You can find it on uh, virtualmosque.com. And he'll go through and actually show you the Hebrew words in question and show you their translation, their transliteration. And you can look at the letters that we've learned today. And he talks about all of the things we're mentioning here. But Rabbi Avi Lipkin has already said it, that the word Hajj is there 
in the scriptures. Now, let's go back and look at this symbol again and talk about some interesting things about it. So the phylacteries. Inside of them are four passages. They mention performing hajj. They mention the name of God, that he's one, and that you should keep this ritual. So from the time of Moses, 3,500 years ago, until today, and including the time of the prophet, Islam, these Jews were doing this. Mm. Take notice of the fact that the cube is between their eyes. Oh, okay. Where yeah. do you turn your face? Right. And then secondly, notice what arm the second phylactery is on. It's on the left arm. Sheikh Omar, when you go to Mecca and you make tawaf, you go clockwise or you go counterclockwise? Oh, okay. Yeah. Counterclockwise is the way you go. Your left arm faces the Kaaba. Mm. And then look how many times they wrap it. They wrap it seven times around their arm. Seven times. They do this ritual three times oh, every wow. day. Now, let's use Sheikh Imran Hussein's uh, methodology for reading the Quran, and let's try to put together a whole bunch of ayat and see if they prove this. Let me uh, fix my camera for a second. It's also very interesting then that the issue of this verse of the Quran that you mentioned, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ is there right after the discussion of the change of Tibla? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're about to show some really fascinating things. Okay. So the first verse of the Quran I want to look at to see if what Rabbi, Rabbi Avi Lipkin is saying is true. Does our scripture actually confirm this? Here is the ayah uh, from Surah Al-Qasas, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the conversation between Shu'aib or Jethro and Moses. Okay. So... Jethro is talking to Moses and he says, mm. okay? So he's telling Moses that he wants him to marry one of his daughters and stay with him for Thamania mm. Hijaj. Eight Hajj. He could have used the word, uh, you know, yeah. am. He could have used the word sena. He could have used all kinds of words there, but he chooses to use this word hijaj, the direct Very. root of the word hajj. Okay. Um, so here we have proof from the Quran that Moses is learning about hajj from Jethro. Okay. Now, even more fascinating, we go to Surah, to, uh, Surah Yunus, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to Moses, and Moses is now to give a command to the children of Israel. It says, ila Musa wa We revealed to Moses and his brother. Mm. So tell them to construct and their houses in Egypt so that they uh, and, and make them وَجَعَلُوا um, بُيُوتَكُمْ Make them face towards a qibla, a direction. If you look up the tafsir for this ayah uh, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, uh, he says that the qibla is Mecca. So Musa is telling them to, to construct their houses so that they face the Qibla in Mecca. Mm. So here we have the proof from the Quran that when Musa goes to them, that he is in fact telling them to face towards the sacred house. And of course, what is he telling them to do? Well, and pray towards it. Mm. Okay. And give good news to the believers. Mm. Now, let's tie this all together. If what Rabbi Avi Lipkin is saying is true, then that means that ritual of the phylactery, the teflon that they put on their forehead and they pray three times a day, was the ritual to tell them to make hajj. Mm. Now, 
let's bring in the prophet sallallahu who comes into medina and for 18 months he fasts with the jews he prays towards jerusalem right he follows their sacred law he mm. tells them about their god mm. he tells them that their scriptures are true and that moses mm -hmm. is a messenger of allah and they're very, 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 very happy to hear all of this from him until something happens, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the Qibla. And then they all get very angry and shocked. And then Allah says something very, 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 very interesting to them. Sayaqulu sufaha'u minan nas. The idiots amongst the people say, what has caused him to turn away from his original Qibla? You've been putting a black cube on your head for thousands of years between your eyes. On your left arm, wrapping it seven times. You're in Medina waiting for a messenger to come to you. He comes to you, and now he tells you to face the cube. <laughs> and you're sitting there with a cube on your forehead, and you're asking the question, what? This doesn't make any sense. And so Allah calls you an idiot. Because the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger. Now, we get back to our original ayah. Do you know who wears the phylacteries, Sheikh Omar? Only men. And so men teach this to their sons. Hmm. So they know Allah. They know Tawheed. They know the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his description. And they know the Hajj pilgrimage. Just like they know their own children. And one of the meanings of Ya'rifuna, who is also in the tafsir referring to the Qibla, because that was what just uh, finished as a subject. Or Bingo, you just tied it all together. Now, what does this have to do with the Dajjal? Well, Rabbi Avi Lipkin is no lover of the Muslim community. In fact, uh, if you ever watch any of his lectures or read his books, he really hates us. And his theory is that because Moses wanted the children of Israel to perform Hajj, then that means Mecca belongs to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And when he mentions that the borders of Israel shall, shall contain the desert to the south, he says that that desert is the Arabian Peninsula, mm -hmm. which includes Mecca and Medina. And by the way, they've been having more and more archaeological diggings and findings of Jews in Arabia now recently. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so now they're like, oh, okay, so we have our heritage in Arabia too. So that's also beginning to take place. Oh, and not only that, I mean, just look at our screen here. Here we have a Jewish Zionist man in Meshid and Nebawi taken a few years ago because now oh, wow. the, the visa statuses have changed uh, for visiting Saudi Arabia or Jazirat al Arab, as it should be called. Not only that, but I would ask your viewers to go research uh, who, which uh, Israeli tech companies are helping with the security of the city yeah. of Mecca right now. Yes, that's right. Yes. Which Israeli, yeah. uh, which Israeli designers are helping with the design of the new Mecca that's being built currently. And then I want to ask your audience to ponder over why on earth they keep demolishing so many Islamic sites around Mecca oh, wow. in the name wow. of expanding the masjid so, to uh, allow for more pilgrims. They have gotten rid of so many historical and important sites. It's, it's just, it's, it's a tragedy really. Well, the reason is very clear and obvious to me, it's because they are demolishing all the traces of Islam that came with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his Sahaba and all of those things so that only the parts that a Jew would care about, the Kaaba and the Maqam of Ibrahim 
and the well of Zamzam remain. And my warning to your audience is that all of this construction that you see going on in Mecca today is not for you and it's not for me. They're not building all these hotels for you and me. They're not expanding the masjid for you and me. They're expanding and building all this stuff for them. So that when they come, it's already laid out for them. Mm. And all of the Islamic things are no longer there. They've been erased. And furthermore, it's important to point out that, that Avi Lipkin's hope is that Sunni and Shi'i Muslims will have a civil war with each other and destroy each other simultaneously so that the Israeli army can invade. That's his hope, and that's what he's working for. By the way, I believe his wife is a Mossad agent also. The So we need to understand that this whole uh, Sunni, Shi, Salafi, Sufi, Diobendi, Brelvi, you know, conflict is being created on purpose, that Muslims are being asked to fight each other so that other people can come pick up the pieces later, which I've seen you mention and warn the Muslim community many times. Um, but we need to see what's going on here, the bigger picture. Now, of course, we know how this all ends. Dajjal does not enter into Mecca and Medina physically. He's not allowed to. Um, and we all know what happens to that army that's going to try and invade Mecca and Medina, that they are swallowed by the earth, right? But that doesn't mean that we help facilitate any of this stuff to take place, right? right? right. <laughs> so anyway, I hope this was a very enlightening uh, talk. It was, me. mashallah, especially that Hajj part. I mean, that was just, subhanAllah. It was all well, go, go read Shibli Zaman's article. Uh, may Allah preserve him. Uh, it's a very fascinating article. It might take like less than 10 minutes to read on virtual mosque. Because um, he'll go in and, you know, I didn't want to take a whole bunch of time today to show you all the Arabic letters and everything, but it, it clearly says Hajj. Um, right. Yes, yes. Unambiguously. And what's so fascinating is if you type in uh, Chag or you type the Hebrew word Hajj into Google, you're going to see that Jews to this day, they use this word for all of their celebrations mm. because it's, it's a word that means celebration. It means mm. sacrifice. It means to go around in circles. It means <laughs> all the things that are associated with Hajj. And, you know, this is very timely, you know, for, for what's... So the way this connects with the Jal is, you know, the Jal, they were waiting for a prophet, right? And they were waiting for a prophet specifically to take over the Arabs. And so part of the prophecy that from our tradition that I don't know about from theirs, even though I think there are things there too about the Canaanites and stuff, but is that they're waiting for a prophet who would then they would believe and then they would take over the Arabs. And now it becomes clear, one, the dimension you added, that specifically so they take over Mecca and uh, go to the place where Moses wanted them to be. And so that becomes very, and I think there is also a narration of the prophet about the Jal and Isa doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And uh, so, so there's a lot more to this that can be uh, looked at. And uh, yes. so, yeah. I, I want your, your audience members, especially those who are students of Sheikh Imran Hussein, who, who do his, uh, who read the Quran every month with the moon, according to the Ejza system that he gave us. I especially want those people to comment in the comment section because there's much more that can be said about all this. There's a lot more research that can be done. There's a reason that prophecy exists in Deuteronomy about a prophet like Moses who's gonna to come to you and bring you unto all truth. That was the prophet Muhammad. He was coming to, to have them make Hajj. If they would have just accepted him, he would have taken them to do the very thing they wanted to do. Right. The very thing they still want to do to this day. They want to make Hajj. They want to, you know, it's like the, the Jews are not happy unless they can do all of the 613 mitzvot, all of the commandments. Those commandments are so important to them because they that's their salvation. 
Mm. And and they even some of them even believe in reincarnation that the Jew will just keep reincarnating until so that he can do all of the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. vote. So so this this Hajj is part of that. Whether they'll admit that or not is another story. But they really want to make Hajj. It's really important. And when you mentioned the other day about the 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 UAE now allowing these five thousand Israeli citizens, they're just creeping in slowly and slowly. Oh and slowly. yeah. Oh yeah taking over this part, that part, changing the laws over and over and over because you see the plan happening. The Quran and the Hadith, if you'll just think about them, they will tell you the future and they'll tell you where <laughs> the world is headed. But you yeah. have to think, you have to read, you know? Mashallah. Okay, very good. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, we'll have more programs together. I was very happy about today's program. Mashallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.